This is a reading from the mystical city of God, the Conception, by Venerable Mary of Agrida. Chapter 2 of Book 2. Concerning a singular favor which the Almighty conferred on Most Holy Mary as soon as she was established in the temple. 429. When the heavenly child Mary had dismissed her parents and entered upon her life in the temple, her teacher assigned to her a place among the rest of the maidens, each of whom occupied a large alcove or little room. The Prince of Heaven prostrated herself on the pavement, and remembering that it was holy ground and part of the temple, she kissed it. <coughs> in humble adoration, she gave thanks to the Lord for this new benefit, and she thanked even the earth for supporting her and allowing her to stand in this holy place, for she held herself unworthy of treading and remaining upon it. Then she turned towards her holy angels and said to them, Celestial princes, messengers of the Almighty, most faithful friends and companions, I beseech you with all the powers of my soul to remain with me in this holy temple of my Lord, and as my vigilant sentinels, reminding me of all that I should do, instructing me and directing me as the teachers and guides of my actions, so that I may fulfill in all things the perfect will of the Most High. Give pleasure to the holy priests, and obey my teacher and my companions. And addressing in particular those whom I mentioned above as the twelve angels of the Apocalypse, she said, And I beseech you, my ambassadors, if the Almighty permit you, go and console my holy parents in their affliction and solitude. 430. While the twelve angels executed her command, Mary remained with the others in heavenly conversation. She began to feel a supernal influence of great power and sweetness, spiritualizing her and elevating her in burning ecstasy, and immediately the Most High commanded the seraphim to assist in illumining and, pre and preparing her most holy soul. Instantly she was filled with the divine light and force, which perfected and proportioned her faculties in accordance with the mysteries now to be manifested to her. Thus prepared and accompanied by her holy angels and many others in the midst of a refulgent host, the celestial child was raised body and soul to the Empyrean heaven, where she was received by the Holy Trinity with befitting benevolence and pleasure. She prostrated herself in the presence of the most mighty and high Lord, as she was wont to do in all her visions, and adored him in profound reverence and humility. Then she was further transformed by new workings of divine light, so that she saw intuitively and face to face the divinity itself. This was the second time that it manifested itself to her in this intuitive manner during the first three years of her life. 431. By no human tongue or any sensible faculty could the effects of this vision and participation of the divine essence ever be described. The person of the father spoke to the future mother of his son and said, My dove, my beloved one, I desire thee to see the treasures of my immutable being and of my infinite perfections, and also to perceive the hidden gifts destined for the souls whom I have chosen as heirs of my glory and who are rescued by the lifeblood of the Lamb. Behold, my daughter, how liberal I am toward my creatures that know and love me. How true in my words, how faithful in my promises, how powerful and admirable in my works. Take notice, my spouse, how ineffably true it is that he who follows me does not walk in darkness. I desire that thou, as my chosen one, be an eyewitness of the treasures which I hold in reserve for raising up the humble, enriching the poor, exalting the downtrodden, and for rewarding all that the mortal shall do and suffer for my name. 432. Other great mysteries were shown to the Holy Child in this vision of the divinity, for as the object presented to the soul in such repeated intuitive visions is infinite, that which remains to be seen will always remain infinite and will excite greater and greater wonder and love in the one thus favored. The Most Holy Mary answered the Lord and said, most high, supreme and eternal God, incomprehensible thou art in thy magnificence, overflowing in thy riches, unspeakable in thy mysteries, most faithful in thy promises, true in thy words, most perfect in thy works, for thou art the Lord, 
infinite and eternal in thy essence and perfections. But, most high Lord, what shall my littleness begin to do at the sight of thy magnificence? I acknowledge myself unworthy to look upon thy greatness, yet I am in great need of being regarded by it. In thy presence, Lord, all creation is as nothing. What shall I, thy servant, do, who am but dust? Fulfill in me all thy desire and thy pleasure. And if trouble and persecutions suffered by mortals and patience, if humility and meekness are so precious in thy eyes, do not consent, O my beloved, that I be deprived of such a rich treasure and pledge of thy love. But as for the, re the rewards of these tribulations, give them to thy servants and friends, who deserve them better than I, for I have not yet labored in thy service and pleasure. 433. The Most High was much pleased with the petition of the Heavenly Child, and he gave to her understand and he gave to her to understand that he would admit her to suffering and labor for his love in the course of her life without at the time revealing to her the order and the manner in which he was to dispense them the princess of heaven gave thanks for this blessing in favor of being chosen to labor and suffer for the glory of god's name burning with desire of securing such favor she asked of his majesty to be allowed to make four vows in his presence of chastity, of poverty, of obedience, and of perpetual enclosure in the temple whither he had called her. To this petition the Lord answered and said to her, My spouse, my thoughts rise above all that is created, and thou, my chosen one, dost not yet know what is to happen to thee in the course of thy life, and thou dost not yet understand why it is impossible to, to fulfill thy fervent desires altogether in the manner which thou now dost imagine. The vow of chastity I permit, and I desire that thou make it. I wish that from this moment thou renounce earthly riches. It is also my will that as far as possible thou observe whatever pertains to the other vows, just as if thou hadst made them all. Thy desire shall be fulfilled through many other virgins in the coming law of grace. For in order to imitate thee and to serve me, they will make these same vows and live together in community, and thou shalt be the mother of many daughters. 434. The Most Holy Child then, in the presence of the Lord, made the vow of chastity, and as for the rest, without binding herself, she renounced all affection for terrestrial and created things. She moreover resolved to obey all creatures for the sake of, for the sake of God. In the fulfillment of these promises, she was more punctual, fervent, and faithful than any who had ever made these vows or ever will make them. Forthwith, the clear and intuitive vision of the divinity ceased, but she was not immediately restored to the earth. For, remaining in the Empyrean heaven, she enjoyed another, an imaginary vision of the Lord in a lower state of ecstasy, so that in connection with it, she saw other mysteries. 435. In this secondary and imaginary vision, some of the seraphim closest to the Lord approached her and by his command adorned and clothed her in the following manner. First of all, her senses were illumined with an effulgent light which filled them with grace and beauty. Then they robed her in a mantle or tunic of most exquisite splendor and girded her with a cincture of vari-colored and transparent stones, of flashing brilliancy which adorned her beyond human comprehension. They signified the immaculate purity and the various heroic virtues of her soul. They placed on her also a necklace or collar of inestimable, inestimable and entrancing beauty, which contained three large stones symbolic of the three great virtues of faith, hope, and charity. This they hung around her neck, letting it fall to her breast, as if indicating the seat of these precious virtues. They also adorned her hands with seven rings of rare beauty, whereby the Holy Ghost wished to proclaim that he had enriched her with, this, with his holy gifts in a most eminent degree. In addition to all this, the Most Holy Trinity crowned her head with an imperial diadem made of inestimable material and set with most precious stones, constituting her thereby as his spouse and as the Empress of Heaven. In testimony whereof the white and refulgent vestments were emblazoned with letters or figures of the finest and the most shining gold, 
proclaiming, Mary, daughter of the Eternal Father, spouse of the Holy Ghost, and mother of the true light. This last name or title the Heavenly Mistress did not understand, but the angels understood it. who, lost in wonder and praise of the author, were assisting at this new and strange ceremony. Finally, the attention of all the angelic spirits was drawn toward the Most High, and a voice proceeded from the throne of the Blessed Trinity, which, addressing the Most Holy Mary, spoke to her, Thou shalt be our spouse, our beloved and chosen one among all creatures for all eternity. The angels shall serve thee, and all the nations and generations shall call thee blessed. Luke chapter 1, verse 48. 436. The sovereign child, being thus attired in the court dress of the divinity, then celebrated a more glorious and marvelous espousal than ever could enter the mind of the highest cherubim and seraphim. For the Most High accepted her as his sole and only spouse, and conferred upon her the highest dignity which can befall a creature. He deposited within her his own divinity in the person of the word. And with all the treasures of grace befitting such eminence, meanwhile the most humble among the humble was lost in the abyss of love and wonder which these benefits and favors caused in her. And in the presence of the Lord she spoke, Most high King and incomprehensible God, who art thou and who am I that thy condescension should look upon me who am dust? unworthy of such mercy. In thee, my Lord, as in a clear mirror, seeing my thy immutable being, I behold and understand without error my lowliness and vileness. I admire thy immensity and deprecate my nothingness. At the sight of thee, I am annihilated and lost in astonishment that the infinite majesty should stoop to so lowly a worm, who can merit only oblivion and contempt of all the creatures. O Lord, my only good, how art thou magnified and exalted in this deed? What marvel dost thou cause through me in thy angelic spirits, who understand thy infinite bounty, magnificence, and mercy, in raising up from the dust her who in it is poor, and placing her among the princes? Psalm 112, verse 7. I accept thee, O my King and my Lord, as my spouse, and I offer myself as thy slave. Let not my understanding attend to any other object, nor my memory hold any other image, nor my will seek other object or pleasure than thee, my highest good, my true and only love. Let not my eyes look upon human creature, nor my faculties and senses attend upon anything beside thee, and whatever thy majesty shall direct, thou alone for thy spouse, my beloved, and she for thee only, who art the immutable and eternal good. 437. The Most High received with ineffable pleasure this consent of the Sovereign Princess to enter into the new espousal with her Most Holy Soul, as upon his true spouse and as mistress of all creation. He now lavished upon her all the treasures of his grace and power, instructing her to ask for whatever she desired and assuring her that nothing would ever be denied her. The Most Humble Dove at once proceeded to beseech the Lord with the most burning charity, to send his only begotten to the world as a remedy for mortals, that all men be called to the true knowledge of this his divinity, that her natural parents, Joachim and Anne, receive an increase of the loving gifts of his right hand, that the poor and afflicted be consoled and comforted in their troubles, and that in herself be fulfilled the pleasure of the divine will. There were some of the more express, these were some of the more express petitions addressed by the new spouse on his occasion on this occasion to the Blessed Trinity. And all the angelic hosts sang new songs of admiration in, prayer, in praise of the Most High, while those appointed by His Majesty, midst heavenly music, bore back the Holy Child from the Empyrean heaven to the place in the temple from which they had brought her. Four hundred thirty-eight. In order to commence at once to put in practice what she had promised in the presence of the Lord, she betook herself to her instructress and offered her all that her mother, St. Anne, had left for her comfort and sustenance, with the exception of a few books and clothes. She requested her to give it to the poor for, or use it for any other purpose according to her pleasure, and that she command and direct her what she was to do. The discreet matron, 
who was, as I have already said, the prophetess Anne, by divine impulse accepted and approved of the offering of the beautiful child and dismissed her entirely poor and stripped of everything except the garments which she wore. She resolved to take care of her in a special manner as one destitute and poor, for other maidens each possessed their spending money and a certain sum assigned and destined for their wearing apparel and for other necessities according to their inclinations. 439. The holy matron, having first consulted the high priest, also gave to the sweetest child a rule of life. By thus despoiling and resigning herself, the queen and mistress of creation obtained a complete freedom and detachment from all creatures and from her own self, neither possessing nor desiring anything except only the most ardent love of God and her own abasement and humiliation. I confess my great ignorance, my vileness and insignificance, which make me entirely unworthy to explain such supernal and hidden mysteries. For where the expert tongues of the wise and the science and the love of the highest cherubim and seraphim are compelled to be mute, what can a useless and abject woman say? I know how much such an attempt would offend against the greatness of these mysteries, if obedience furnished no excuse. But even in obeying I tremble, and I fear that what I omit and am ignorant of is the greater, and what I know and say is the more insignificant part of all the mysteries and the doings of this city of God, the Most Holy Mary. Instruction of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, 440. My daughter, among the great and ineffable favors of the Omnipotent in the course of my life was the one which thou hast just learned and described, for by this clear vision of the divinity and of the incomprehensible essence I acquired knowledge of the most hidden sacraments and mysteries, and in this adornment and espousal I received incomparable blessings and felt the sweetest workings of the divinity in my spirit. My desire to take the four vows of poverty, obedience, chastity, and enclosure pleased the Lord very much, and I merited thereby that the God-fearing in the church and in the law of grace are drawn to live under these vows as is the custom in the present time. This was the beginning of that which you religious practice now, fulfilling the words of David in the 44th Psalm, after her shall virgins be brought to the king. For the Lord ordained that my aspirations be the foundation of religious life and of the evangelical law. I fulfilled entirely and perfectly all that I proposed to the Lord as far as was possible in my state of life. Never did I look upon the face of a man not even on that of my husband Joseph, nor on that of the angels when they appeared to me in human form, though I saw and knew them all in God. Never did I incline toward any creature, rational or irrational, nor toward any human operation or tendency, but in all things I was governed by the Most High, either directly by himself or indirectly through the obedience to which I freely subjected myself. 441. Do not forget, my dearest, that the religious state is consecrated and ordained by the Most High for maintaining the doctrine of Christian perfection and the close imitation of the life of my Son, and that, therefore, the souls who in religious life are sunk in sleepy forgetfulness of their high blessing and lead a life more listless and lax than many worldly men are, are objects of great wrath of the Lord, and a severer judgment and chastisement await them that, than others. The demon, also ancient and astute serpent as he is, use, uses more diligence in his attempts to overcome religious men and women than to conquer all the rest of worldly men. And if one of these religious fall, all hell exerts the greatest solicitude and care to prevent his using the many means which religion affords for rising from a fall, such as obedience and holy exercises and the frequent use of the sacraments. To make all these remedies miscarry and be of no use to the fallen religious, the enemy applies so many cunning snares that it would fill with terror anyone who saw them. However much of this is recognized in the actions and artifices by which a lax religious soul tries to defend its remissness, excusing it by specious arguments, if it does not break out in disobedience and yet greater disorders and faults. 442. 
Be careful, therefore, my daughter, and fear so dreadful a danger. By divine assistance of grace, raise thyself above thyself, never permitting thy will to consent to any disorderly affection or movement. I wish thee to consume thyself in dying to thy passions and in becoming entirely spiritualized, so that having extinguished within thee all that is of earth, thou mayest come to lead an angelic life in conversation, in order to deserve the name of spouse of Christ. Thou must pass beyond the limits and the sphere of a human being, and ascend to another state and divine existence. Although thou art earth, thou must be a blessed earth, without the thorns of passion, one whose fruit is all for the Lord, its master. If thou hast for thy spouse that supreme and mighty Lord, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, consider it beneath thy dignity to turn thy eyes, and much more thy heart, toward such vile slaves as are the human creatures, for even the angels love and respect thee for thy dignity as spouse of the Most High. If even among men it is held to be a daring and boundless insolence in a plebeian to cast longing eyes upon the spouse of a prince, what a crime it could it, would it be to cast them on the spouse of the heavenly and omnipotent king? And it would not be a smaller crime if she herself would receive and consent to such familiarity. Consider and assure thyself that the punishment reserved for this sin is inconceivably terrible, and I do not show it to thee visibly, lest thou perish in thy weakness. I wish that for thee my instructions suffice to urge thee to the fulfillment of all I admonish, and to imitate me as my disciple, as far as thy powers go. Be also solicitous in recalling this instruction to the mind of thy nuns, and in seeing that they live up to it. 443. My mistress and my most kind queen, in the joy of my soul, I listen to thy sweetest words, so full of spirit and of life, and I wish to inscribe them in the interior of my heart, together with the graces of, the, of thy most holy Son, which I beseech thee to obtain for me. If thou give me permission, I will speak in thy presence as an ignorant disciple with her mistress and teacher. I desire, O my mother and protectress, though I am so unworthy and remiss, to fulfill the four vows of my profession according to thy commands and according to my obligation. Though I am so unworthy and remiss therein, yet I beseech thee, give me a, four, give me a more full instruction which may serve me as a guide and direction in the fulfillment of this duty and as a complement of these vows which thou hast placed in my heart.